Welcome back from the break, everybody. We're so glad to uh, have you back. Hope you had a nice, refreshing little um, stretch and coffee refill and all good things. Um, we are moving on to our next speakers. We have um, Joan Nicholson, who is an ESG consultant and host of the Electric Ladies podcast. So um, find that and subscribe if you haven't already. And she'll be talking to us today about finding your marketing message in the ESG economy. So welcome, Joan. Sorry, you were a little bit quicker than I expected. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. I'm delighted to be here. Hi, everybody. If anybody else can be on uh, camera, it'd be really fun. I love to see everybody. Is that possible? I don't know. We'll see. Um, I see a few people on camera. Hi, hi, Nicole. It's good to actually see you after all these emails. Yeah. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Julie. Hi, Kendra. Hi, Susan. Hi, Colleen. Hi, Kayla. Hi, Jeffrey. Hi, Mitch. Okay, so I am going to share my screen. Hold on a second. Um, I don't know about you, but I have too many windows open. Okay, <clears throat> so um, I am going to do a full screen mode because I think I can still see you all this way. Yes, can you see that? Yep. Okay, good. Fabulous. And I know you guys are, you're recording, right? Yes. Okay, good. Perfecto. Because I don't see the little recording gizmo, so I was just confused. Um, so first of all, I'm going to introduce me. Um, my name is Joan Michelson, and uh, as you heard, I'm an ESG consultant. I have the Electric Ladies podcast. I've interviewed over 370 women in the space. Um, hmm, there we go. And um, that's me speaking at, uh, actually at the Department of Defense just before COVID shut the world down. I was their last in-house speaker, in-person speaker. But anyway, so um, I'm, uh, I have a lot of experience in this space. I've been uh, in corporate America and as a journalist. Um, what I started to say is I've interviewed 370, give or take, women on my show. It was originally called Green Connections Radio. You might have heard of it that way. Changed the name about 18 months ago. Um, and I particularly want to mention it because all of you seem to really want more, in, be hungry about information in the space and to know more about what other people are doing. Have at it. There's 370 women from uh, a few men, um, but I, I focus on women, uh, a few men in the beginning, I should say. Um, and uh, they're from across the economy because obviously energy, sustainability, and climate are across the economy, right? So um, I just interviewed the chief marketing officer of Ford, the chief sustainability officer of General Motors. Um, I've interviewed the former secretary of the Air Force, the lot on sustainable fashion, batteries, entertainment venues, take your pick. So what, pretty much whatever industry you're in, there's an intersection reporting. Um, we'll get into that a little bit. But uh, for those of you who are in publicly traded companies, especially or focused on the SEC rules, I interviewed Christina Wyatt who led the team developing the climate disclosure rules. So you all uh, wanna listen to that. So um, that's enough about me. I also write for Forbes on these issues. And I also, interestingly, because so many of you are interested in this um, kind of new, it seems, to this career space, um, I write a lot about careers also. Um, I focus on women, um, but Jeff, it applies to men too. <laughs> So it really is applicable to anybody. So you can find um, a lot on that, especially for careers in this space. Okay, so uh, and I do some coaching on that. So have at it if you have any questions. Um, I'm not gonna read the chat right away as I'm talking to you, but I will, and I'd like to get to know you guys a little bit more. And I'd also like to, uh, I'm gonna have, kind of participation a bit and ask you guys some questions and have, please save your questions because I do want them. Um, 
so I caught a little bit in the very beginning about where some of you were from. I heard oil and gas. I heard different industries. I heard different parts of the country. So if you guys can um, maybe, un since there's only uh, a dozen of us here, if you want to chime in and kind of say where you're at. Um, I heard a little bit, of, a few people said they were kind of new to the spit to, to ESG, but they've been in marketing a while. So um, if you can give me, anybody want to chime in and just kind of pop up, unmute yourself and say where you're from and, and what brings you here. I know you did this a couple hours ago, but I wasn't taking notes and paying complete attention. I'd like to get some refresher if it's okay with you. Anybody? Come on, don't be shy. You're marketing people. You can't be shy. Shy and marketing communications don't go together. I'll go. Feel free to come off of mute. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Colleen. Hi, Joan. Thanks for presenting today. Uh, I'm Colleen. I work for TMX Group in Canada. We are the parent company of the Toronto Stock Exchange, so it's interesting, uh, okay. and other exchanges. So what's interesting about ESG in our context is that it's not only our own ESG requirements, but we also provide a lot of uh, like tools and support for our issuers uh, to help them um, like devise and report on their, their ESG plan. So there's a lot of interesting kind of interrelations and, and context around that. Uh, and my role is focused on the employee communications component, um, more the uh, enterprise communications than employee experience program. So um, I'm just looking forward to learning more about kind of this area of our business and uh, what people's experiences um, and best practices are in ESG communications. Perfect. Fabulous. Okay. Julie, Susan, somebody else want to chime in? Come on. There we go. Hi, I'm, I'm Julie. Uh, I'm based in DC. I've been in communications uh, my whole career. I've done the corporate comm side, media relations side, PR, um, internal comms, external. Um, and I, uh, in the past couple of years, have started working with energy companies. And I'd like to formally learn more about ESG. Um, so that I can go for ESG specific communications positions as I'm job searching. Cool. Well, um, I'm in DC too. So, um, and obviously the career stuff will be right up your alley. So we can chat about that if you like at some point. Anybody else? Come on. Jeffrey, I heard some other energy people, Abby, Susan, Lisa. Yeah, so Joan, um, so I just started in ESG. Um, my background, like most, um, is in corporate communications. And our team, um, actually, Amanda's, your presentation is quite relevant. We just established our framework, so it's quite new. And um, we've only launched, I think it's our third annual corporate report. So we're getting the ground, but we're learning how to operationalize our framework. So, um, so I'm hoping to gain a lot of insights over the next two days. Good. And what industry are you in? Technology. Okay, tech. Okay, good. Cool. Okay, next victim. I mean, next <laughs> uh, Susan Johnson. Um, I'm a global marketing director for Parker Wellbore um, in the oil and gas space upstream. Cool. Good for you for being here, girlfriend. <laughs> We're not, we really are not the devil incarnate that everyone I know, wants you're to not, make you us know, and it's funny because um, I, I'm just to full, full disclosure, I'm an all of the above person, and especially as a journalist and a problem solver. So um, thank, I mean that when I say thank you for being here. I mean that quite genuinely. And I know a lot of people at a lot of the oil company, oil and gas company. So power to you, girl. We need you guys. We need you guys badly. Thank you. You're welcome. Colleen, Kendra, Mitch, Jeff, Kayla, who else wants to chime in? going to keep secret okay you'll be incognito all right well there you have it if you can we'll we'll deal with you later no i'm kidding um well what do you want to get out of today i mean it sounds like you know you're all kind of being sponges so um and and i got a little bit of a sense from abby susan um julie and um i forgot your name already um the first lady who spoke, I didn't write down your name. Isn't that terrible of me? Oh, Colleen. Colleen, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for that. So um, I'm going to back it up and talk about ESG in the context of building corporate trust. 
Um, a really interesting, I don't know if you guys ever follow this report, but the uh, Edelman PR, which is, you know, ginormous long-term PR firm, does a trust barometer study every year. And they survey 36,000 people in 28 countries. So this is a big deal, right? And 61% of people said that business is the most trusted institution. And 77% trust their employer the most. It's a decision that plays into where you work, what kind of, po uh, what kind of products you buy, um, and what kind of leadership you have, which I'll get into in a minute. But I want to center the conversation of ESG for us in trust. Your job is to help them um, your your companies are now being asked to to take societal leadership, and your job, our job as communicators, is to help build that trust and credibility, right? ESG at its core is about trust and credibility. Yes, it's risk management, but it's really about can I trust what you're saying? Can I trust the products you're putting out? Can I trust that the workplace is going to be safe? Can I trust that the financial data you're giving me is accurate, et cetera, et cetera, right? Can I trust that you're gonna pay your bills? So, and it's indirectly as well as directly. So when you're thinking about the work that you're doing and you're thinking about the messaging that you're developing and really you're thinking about ESG and e you can even talk about it this way in meetings. Um, I got into the space about 15 years ago after years in management consulting and journalism um, by Chrysler. I was recruited to head up communications and co-head sales and marketing of the electric car division. And by the way, I'd never worked in the car business. It was a very interesting experience. Um, I just realized, I think I'm going to put on headphones. It might be a better recording. But the um, the reason I bring it up is I would have to sit in executive committee meetings and they would talk about all of these great decisions, you know, these decisions that they thought were great about cost cutting or whatever. And I would have to come in and say, well, let me tell you what that's going to do down the line. Let me tell you how that's going to play through and what, where that might risk the reputation of the company, risk sales, et cetera. And so you're building trust within the organization in you and you're helping the organization build trust in the marketplace and with your employers employees i heard um julie in particular talk about um can you hear me okay can you hear me somebody say yes somebody yep. say no. okay <laughs> um about employees also and again i had a lot of guests say to me employees, uh, new recruits are coming to me to interview about sustainability issues because they're not going to make a decision about where to work until they know for sure that we're focused on this. So I'm going to give you my definition of ESG, and I know others have given you theirs. So for me, environment is reducing the organization's negative impact on the environment. It's also about reducing its vulnerability to climate change. Um, and that can be you have operations on a coast. It can be obviously CO2 emissions. It's also the safety of the workplace. You know, people are reluctant to go back to work for a lot of different reasons. And one of them is the safety of the workplace as well as schedules and commuting, et cetera. So environment is, think of environment in a little bit broader term. Think of it as immediate environment of where they work, and then think of it in kind of concentric circles of the environments of your employees, of your suppliers, of your customers, and of course of society. And that, that societal responsibility, okay, that plays into that. And social is, um, as some of the folks said before, taking care of all of your stakeholders, your employees, your suppliers, your customers, your shareholders, and the communities you work in. And that's become very, very important <clears throat> um, now as well. Um, yes, it's diversity and yes, it's um, bias and all those kinds of things. But it's really about care and trust and credibility. If your employees trust that you're going to level with them 
and your customers trust that you're going to level with them, they will give you a lot more slack. Okay, because this is an ongoing process. As others have said, this is an ongoing evolutionary process. And governance to me is really about transparency and accountability, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as good management. Having a diverse board, having a leadership team, and, and leadership team having um, reasonable compensation, ethics, harassment, but taking these things serious, stuff happens, right? It's a matter of how you deal with it, and that builds the trust. Um, and that those are all metrics that come into your reporting and it comes into what you can work with. And we'll get into that. So now I want to center it in values and COVID in my estimation, COVID, the convergence of COVID, climate change and the resurgence really of social equity movements really changed the whole conversation and the whole economy. I wrote about it in Forbes as a profound paradigm shift. And if you look at the agenda of the World Economic Forum, if you look at the, um, you know, she's at the stock exchange. I mean, every company, every industry is now looking at this. Again, recruiting and retaining talent. People want to work for companies that they believe in and they trust um, more than ever. Uh, purchasing decisions. Uh, I'll show you some data points in a minute about how people really want to make um, purchasing decisions. Well, I just showed you a second ago, actually, purchasing decisions from companies, I think it's 61% want to make purchasing decisions from companies. They'll even pay more for sustainable solutions and they'll pay more for brands that they trust. I mean, I was talking to somebody last night at an event who is leasing a Tesla and they said, because of what Elon Musk has been doing, they're going to get rid of their Tesla and get a different electric car. That's amazing. I mean, think about that, right? So B2B contracts, yes, publicly traded companies have to report this stuff, but you're, we're finding now that it's in every, R, it's not every, but it's in most RFPs, requests for proposals, it's in government contracts. You need to have this information and it's driving every aspect of the economy. Obviously investment decisions, and I'm, I'm sure all of you know that the SEC is coming out with the final climate risk disclosure rules, which they presented earlier this year. So it's really a focus on corporate citizenship. I have a colleague who calls it brand citizenship. So what I want you to do now is, is take out a piece of paper and, and you might not wanna do it on the screen because we'll hear the clicking a little bit maybe, but it's up to you. But I'd like you to write down words that reflect your organization's values. This messaging really starts with values in my world. So write down, just kind of brainstorm. Don't edit, don't say no, my boss wouldn't agree with that, forget it. Just write, just, just blurt, okay? Well, I'm gonna give you a, about 30 seconds to do that. But write down words that just come to mind. Um, you can use words that you have used in your messaging. Now you can use words, think of words maybe that your boss has used, that your the CEO has used, that the board has used, that your customers have used. Um, so just write. Right, 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 right. Okay. Now I want you to put next to each word which stakeholders value that? And you'll prioritize later because everybody has different priorities, right? But think about which stakeholders particularly value which value, right? Which ones, who really focuses on which value? Which one do they zero in on? Which one do they talk about the most? And you'll fill this in later, you'll fill it in as we talk, you'll fill it in later today, tomorrow, whatever. It can be an organic document, okay? And now write down on the side or near there, your organization's goals. And I, yes, it can be profitability goal related goals, you know, increase sales 10X by 2024 or whatever, right? It can be, um, expanding into a new market. I just interviewed the chief engineer of the F-150 Ford, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, their goal was, was 
to see what would happen in the marketplace with this new truck of the iconic electric version of their truck. And they had amazing results, which I'll talk about in a second because their messaging is really important. So think about this, write this down. And as you go through and as you take a walk, as you whatever, as your brain goes and you read things, you'll add to it, okay? So what I want to do is... I want you to think about your messaging as it connects to company performance. And again, this has to this has to match, not necessarily match, that's not the right word. This has to, to correspond to each of the company goals. So for example, if your goal is to increase sales uh, X amount or X percent, there's a piece of that that will be targeting the sustainability market, the sustainable, the, the psychographics of your market. Think about the psychographics of your stakeholders. Are they early adopters? Are they, you know, it could be um, age, income, gender, all of the usual stuff or demographics. Or it could be really psychographics like early adopter, um, late adopter, um uh trend lover um whatever okay you can even go grandparent parent non-parent what have you okay but um break down the company performance and the values by into demographic into demographic into uh profiles of your markets also okay so you're you're creating kind of um and I thought about presenting it this way, but it, everybody's brain works differently. You can present it as a matrix and you'll just write this stuff down and then you'll, you'll figure out what works best for your organization and your priorities because it's very individualized. Um, so it's got to be centered in the company performance and it's got to be integrated throughout the strategies. So for example, as I started to say, when I was at Chrysler, I'd sit in the community in the executive committee meetings and somebody would have some great idea about some product, some part that would reduce the cost of the car. And I'd let them talk and then I'd say, okay, so let me tell you how that's going to play through the system. And I'd show them where we'd lose sales or where the, what the public pushback would be, what the media story would be, what the impact on customer service would be, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes they'd get mad at me and say, whose side are you on? And I go, hey, this is the impact it's going to have, and we have to think about this, right? So think about sustainability and the ESG issues as how they will play throughout the strategies in your organization. And that has to play into the messaging also, because you're going to have messaging that corresponds to each aspect of the business, because you're going to be talking to different people, suppliers, uh, investors, et cetera, right? So you're going to have the way that it intersects will be a little bit different. And it also has to be centered in data, 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 data. It's all about the data. I mean, as, as um, I think it was Penny said earlier, you have to be able to back up everything that you say, <clears throat> every claim that you make. But if you go in and you look at the data and say, here's our water use, here's our energy use, here's our CO2, here are our 2023 net zero goals, what have you, right? Here are, here's the reality of our waste right now. Here's how much we're actually recycling. And then you can, also use some of that data as a tool to go into your into your fellow employees in the you know the engineering department or the whatever product development or whatever and say hey i see that you know our waste is x amount is there a way to reduce that maybe by using stuff again can is there some way to recycle it or reuse it melt it down use recycled materials whatever okay and again, you're going to be thinking about the priorities of your different markets as you do your messaging, because you're going to have messaging for the different uh, stakeholders and the different markets as you've identified them, okay? And when you collect this data, sometimes I'm a journalist, so it's my reflex, but a lot of times we forget to get the source of it. I cannot tell you how many presentations I see, and I'm sure you do too, where... They don't give the 
leaping source. They make some quote, but they don't tell you where it's from. And you can't do that. You have to be able to, it'll, it'll boost your credibility as an employee and as an expert, but it'll help your company's credibility because it's, be, it's again, it's transparency, it's trust. Okay. And look at the data for your industry. I've done a lot on sustainable fashion. I've done a lot on automotive. I've done a lot on energy. They each have different data points, right? Um, I interviewed the 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 C level executives from General Motors about how they uh, how they're transitioning their entire company from making internal combustion engine gas powered cars to making it, um, electric cars. That's a ginormous bleeping impact across every metric, right? Different staff, different assembly plants, different parts. The parts are made of different materials. It's 30% fewer parts. It's amazing. And then clothing. I mean, don't get me started on sustainable clothing. <laughs> the fashion industry is a mess. But you get my point. There's so many, there's a lot more water there, right? Energy sector uses a lot of water. So think about also the data for your industry. And this all plays into the messaging because you're collecting all this and then you'll see where your strengths are and what you need to disclose based on your stakeholder values and what you have to work with and what your company's goals are. And frankly, where you're being held accountable also, what your performance metrics are and what your boss's metrics are. Um, because you want to, we want to make you look good, right? That's part of the point. Hello, that's why you're here. Um, so again, look at the data that you're collecting. Look at your company's performance. Look at the company's strategies and goals. If they don't have ESG related goals, you can help them develop them, and be. Uh, ambitious. Don't don't do something that you know cannot be met, but try to push them. Try to push them because you'll look. The organization will look better. It's better to to push them and get as close as you can and be somewhat ambitious than to not. I mean, I'm not saying pull a General Motors and say we're not going to make this vehicle anymore, but you get the point, right? So be the company will look better if it's if it's and look like it's not just window dressing which is another word for greenwashing but is it look like it's not just lip service if it's really trying to push right and you've got to change i mean and they'll update dell has been doing this for many years their their goals change all the time cuz they're achieving them right or they're creating new products they're now coming out with the with a computer that has many fewer parts. I'll get to that in a second. So, um, and also use your CEO's words. Use the mission, look at this, look at these, these are parts that you're gonna put together for your messaging. And then as you're developing messages, you're going through your job, you have these pieces like modules to work with, depending upon the situation and what you need to talk about and where you need to go. If you I will tell you as a reporter, if you keep using the same phrase over and 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 over again, I mean, there's there's something to be said for a tagline like built for and tough, you know, but don't overdo it because the public doesn't like it. Social media doesn't doesn't it doesn't hold as much credibility if all you're doing is saying the same thing over and over again. You have to have there has to be an authenticity in there and authenticity comes from changing your words a little bit. You can mean, mean the same thing, but vary it up. And that's why I'm giving you modules and pieces to put together to match the moment, the situation you're dealing with, okay? So talk a little bit about who wants to chime in here a little bit and talk about how are you identifying your, your stakeholder values? I'd like to get some participation here. Um, who wants to chime in? Who hasn't spoken up yet? Anybody or anybody who has spoken up already? Somebody want to pop up? No. Oh, your marketing communications people who are shy? Come on, we can't be shy. Jeffrey, Kendra, you haven't spoken up yet. Lisa, you're not on camera. Everybody off camera? My, did I lose everybody or are you still here? 
Okay, Susan is still here. I see your face. There we go. How are you identifying shareholder value, Susan? Well, our our when you talk about data, 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 um, we keep track on even minute things along the way because we're seeing more and more in contracts that um, there is an element that you know we have to support um, to be able to get the contract. We have to be able to support what our our client customer customer clients. Um, ESG goals, climate change goals, emissions, that kind of stuff. We have to be able to prove that. So it's not just about fluffy statements. It's about what the data is on carbon emissions or whatever the case is. So um, our, our CEOs um, constantly doing thought leadership things, town halls, um, getting that message out. And it very much um, aligns to what our five-year tactical plan is. Good, great. So uh, when you talk about, so you're defining your stakeholder values as what it is they say they're looking for in the RFPs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So are you using, are you going into any other data sources? Because sometimes people, uh, yes, you obviously have to respond to that, but at the same time, it's beyond that because to resonate with them, it's like any other relationship. Sometimes the agenda is not quite so obvious and sometimes the motivation is not quite so obvious and sometimes the values are you know not quite so obvious right I like color you can tell that from looking at me <laughs> but I didn't say that right okay so um you want to how else are you trying to understand them are you using market research are you using surveys are you using you know employee surveys well we look at we've done a pretty comprehensive study on our top 25 um, clients and they would be you know huge shells and exons and bps of the world and very much have studied what their net zero goals are um, we've been to ESG meetings with them. Um, we, we have to go in with a plan that says um, specifically the things that we're going to do in order to support what their goals are as well. If you can't come up with actions identifiable that support what you know they're trying to do, then you, you just won't get the contract. Absolutely. Absolutely. What I'm getting at is how you're trying to understand those people uh, beyond that a little bit. Um, and Julie, you can chime in too. I see your beautiful face as well. I love all these fabulous women. Oh, they're um, very clear about it. You don't have to ask okay. or whatever. I mean, it's front and center to every single conversation we have with these people. Oh, I'm sure of that. I, what I'm trying to get at is below the surface of that is to talk about some of their some of the other values that drive them that the people who are making the decisions um, and other places that it might not be quite so hand uh, delivered in, you know, in their mission statement, their company mission statements, et cetera, they might not talk about all the time if, if those are real. Um, well, I think it's about trust. It's about innovation, um, collaboration for sure. And I think collaboration with regard to this whole ESG thing, the collaboration piece has probably popped up as the most important one um, to the point that they are somewhat, somewhat less concerned about what an actual dollar amount is. If you can prove that, you know, through collaboration and they trust you that you're going to be able to deliver, they're really looking for a partner um in this i don't know if that's what you were getting at but that's great i i don't have an agenda i'm i mean i don't have a i wasn't looking for something i wanted to see what you were what your folks were looking for exactly no that's exactly right and i'm going to talk about collaboration a little bit as a strategy because it's a big one it's leverage it's you know it's also leverage right um and uh it can give you credibility as well julie did you want to chime in you're on mute. Okay, there I am. <laughs> uh, yeah, so while I have started working with energy companies, again, the space is new for me. Um, but observationally, I've, I've noticed um, 
in regard to the, the values conversation. Um, so I'm originally from the Gulf Coast area of the U.S., though I've been on the East Coast with my parents for since childhood, but that's originally where I'm from. And one of the things that, um, you know, when I'm down there, if I'm visiting cousins or whatever, we actually have conversations about sort of the rape of the land because the Gulf Coast is such a, a rich area. And you've got all these um, powerful, uh, very successful chemical enterprises, and of course, oil and gas. And um, in some some relatives who work in some of those places and in really nice positions um, have been in conversations where the values don't match. So it's so in regards to ESG, those companies are going to do in their in their opinion um, the very least because to do the um, even a, a medium level of um, uh, respectful chemical enterprising would be would result in a very large reduction in profit and then some of the processes uh, you, know, you know it's chemistry so it, it's there's only so much they can do um and in a past position I had uh, where I first, some years ago, where I first started thinking, you know, down the road, this might be a field that I want to go into. Back then it was all called CSR though. So, um, and that had to do with chemical innovation. And those uh, were, this was over 15 years ago, maybe even 20, but processes were really, really, some organizations like Eli Lilly, um, and some uh, methane producing organizations were really starting to look at chemical innovation as a way to be more respectful of the environment. So, I mean, I kind of said a few things around there, but, but sort of, but basically sharing um, the anecdote that I've talked to people through relatives who've worked in, in some of these chemical companies, and there's only so much ESG they're going to do, and that so much is usually the minimal amount. And then my interest uh, triggered uh, from some work through the American Chemical Society with companies who were interested in doing the maximum, and that had to do with chemical innovation in biomass and chemical innovation in pharmaceutical production. Yeah, so it's all different. And you bring up a really good point, which is you have to match the language of your stakeholder, of your of your stakeholder. And that's what I was also trying to get at. Um, I interviewed the chief sustainability officer of Campbell Soup, and they told me that they can't use the words climate change in a meeting or they'll clear the room. So they have to talk about it in the context of saving money or increasing the market or whatever. I have to use just business terminology, right? And so that's part of what I'm talking about is we talk about messaging. It Messaging is words. Messaging is, is more than that storytelling too. And so there's some other tools here, but that's why the market research and getting to the values of these people, not just the numbers that they ask for in a report can be really helpful and helping you figure out how to really reach them on a, on a direct, per we're all people, you're, you're reaching humans, humans have feelings, humans have priorities. And so it's really about values that drive trust and increase credibility. And then, you know, as you can see, there's a range of tools here. So one of the thing, one of the examples I want to give you is Dell, because Dell has been at this a long time. And I've gotten to know a bunch of them, but and Intel has been at it a long time, but they have a very cool. So here's how they they do their some of their messaging. Again, they talk about integrity, responsible business ethics, and they give, you know, here's the solid numbers. It's simple. It's a guy. And then they have this video, which I am going to try to share. How's that? Um, and see if I can do this. Um, optimize for video, share sound. Well, let's see if I can do this. We'll give it a shot here. And you let me know if you can see. Can you see this? Change is inevitable. Whether it's for the better depends on what we all do next. That's why John, we're we working it, to turn the greatest challenge of our time oh, that's interesting. into the greatest opportunity to drive human progress. With the right actions, technology. Okay, hang on. 
hang on. I want you to be able to see it because it's important. That's weird. I think it's because I was double sharing. Um, I can put this in the chat too, but it's um, it's a very it's a short video. It's only about a minute. Um, I think I'm able to grab it. Let me see if I can just take over share screen for a second because you were able to share. There we go. Yeah, I did. So there's the, I put it in the chat to everybody too. Oh, there we go. Let me know if everyone can see this on my end. Yeah, you might want to do a full screen though. Try to do show full screen. There we go. Change is inevitable. Whether it's for the better depends on what we all do next. That's why we're working to turn the greatest challenge of our time into the greatest opportunity to drive human progress. With the right actions, technology, measurement, partnerships, and people, we will achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. To do this, we're reducing our energy needs while accelerating and advocating for the use of renewable electricity. We're working with our suppliers to help them manage their emissions, and we're continuing to design, build, and test innovative products and business models to reduce emissions. And we'll do it together, harnessing the power of technology to help people, businesses, and society achieve their own climate goals so that we can face the changes that are to come and embrace new solutions that will transform the future of our planet. Join us. Thank you, Nicole. I appreciate that. That's really You're helpful. Welcome. Um, so one of the things that I want to, that, that we can do, and one of the reasons I want to show you that and all of these examples is you can um, take these and deconstruct them. So break it down. Let me stop this for a second. Break it down and watch that video again. I put it in the chat or watch, look at anybody, any company's messaging and break it down. Look at the words they're using. Look at the stakeholders they're trying to reach. Look at the values that they're, that they're emphasizing. Look at the, the ways that they're building trust and credibility. Look at the data points that they're using and, and break it down. And that will help you find the pieces for yours. And it will help you find pieces that you can mix and match for whatever the messaging situation is and do it in a way that gives you credibility. Okay, because you have to have credibility. And as the woman said earlier, I don't know, I'll find out is a very credible answer. If somebody says, especially for a reporter or whoever, or I, um, we're working on that. We know this isn't perfect. I mean, be willing to share the, the, the good part for the recipient of the ESG paradigm is that it forces you to disclose the good, the bad, and the ugly. And frankly, that boosts your credibility and increases trust in your organization. So don't be afraid to share the data that says we're working on this. We are a work in progress, like the rest of us as human beings, right? We're a work in progress. So, um, I am not seeing you guys for some reason now all of a sudden. I was seeing you guys before. I don't know why I'm not seeing you when I share my screen. That's weird. Maybe it's because I was sharing two screens. I don't know. Anyway, so um, that's a, this quote, information quality now the most powerful trust builder is from the um, Edelman barometer, trust barometer information is golden. Okay, so here's four different ways you can present. This is interesting. Dow is presenting their numbers in multiple different ways. They're using different frameworks. SASB is very industry oriented. GRI, the World Economic Forum, CDP, there's all kinds of others. They each focus on a different area, which is in part why the uh, SEC is coming out with theirs, right? But um, there's different ways to present the information. Case studies, the reports, um, again, real data, focus on what your stakeholders care about and using different reporting standards, but most importantly, make it relevant to your industry. And I would say relevant to your stakeholders and make it easy to find. 
as a reporter and uh, media will help you build your credibility, you don't, you don't want to make it hard for people like me to find your information. If you make it hard for us to find the information, we may not trust it. So make it easy to find, be upfront about what's a work in progress, um, share a little more than you're probably comfortable with because it helps you build your credibility. And again, these are pieces of the messaging you can put together, right? So, and uh, now to get to, to her point about, um, Susan's point about collaboration. Uh, collaboration is really critical. I did, I achieved a lot of great goals, for example, at Chrysler and other organizations with uh, collaborations, with partnerships and with alliances. Dell partners with Responsible Business Alliance, for example, um, and in part that's, uh, and they are partially responsible for helping them develop this new computer that uses fewer parts and um, more and parts made from recycled uh, materials and things like that. And I think their motherboard is going to be 30% smaller or something. Um, everything's going to be, have less of an environmental impact. At Chrysler, I developed a partnership with Chrysler, a multidimensional partnership that allowed us to achieve multiple goals, legislative goals even, because our cars at the time were not even uh, allowed on all streets, which was mind boggling to think about, but it's true. Um, and then also gave us access to, um, to, to different markets, to different entities, to different events, obviously. And the partnership that I did for our electric car division was so successful that the, che the CEO of all of Chrysler adopted for the whole company. So you want to do a multidimensional partnership. You want to use partnerships that achieve your ESG goals and other goals. So obviously, you know, I'm sure you've seen the, the nauseam, the ads that Subaru does and all the partnerships that they do with environmental and social nonprofits to boost their or their um, branding um, as a responsible company. And um, I'm going to push back a little bit on something that somebody else said earlier. Um, I do believe that there are companies that really seriously integrate this, that they're not doing it for another reason. And they quoted Patagonia, which of course is one of them. But I think Subaru and, and Dell, um, and there are a lot of companies that genuinely want to do this, that genuinely believe in it. That gen I mean, General Motors making a commitment to stop making internal combustion engines is beyond just the marketplace okay that's a real commitment um you don't put 35 billion dollars into changing your entire business model um flippantly right it's got to make sense across the board but it's ultimately in this case it's very much a values and environmental position and again you know you, uh, a few of you are in oil and gas obviously you know you have to broaden your market because the market is gonna is we're demanding it right so you have to you have to do it authentically um and you have to be upfront about why you're doing it but there are a lot of companies that are doing this very much because it's in their dna um but building these alliances to go back to that for a second they'll give you more access to they'll help you understand your stakeholders right because they'll give you more and they'll give you more of them they'll give you access to data about those stakeholders and about your impact and about your credibility about their values, about what works for them. And they'll give, they'll help you burnish your credentials, right? I mean, um, all of the organizations that AARP works with have to go through a very rigorous approval process. Um, Dell and Responsible Business Alliance obviously helps them. Subaru and the environmental nonprofits um, obviously help them. I mean, you guys all have your own, you know, partnerships I'm sure that you know about, but it definitely gives you data. It gives you um, access to understanding your markets better, access to the markets, of course, burnishing your credentials, um, and it can help you achieve your ESG goals. For example, our, our cars, a lot of companies um, partnered with us and, and wanted to buy our cars to reduce their carbon footprint, and then they fell in love with the cars and wanted more of them, and it was a win-win. So, you know, you never know where that's going to go, right? So... The other thing I want to talk about, which is probably important to a lot of you, is how to sell ESG messaging in, in, internally. So walk in prepared, okay? 
So data is king, operational data, customer survey data, employee surveys, um, market research, investor analysis, ESG reports. Um, I saw something earlier that 71% of investors want more companies to report more ESG data. So come in armed with the data that is going to back up the need to have this messaging, the need to have ESG initiatives and partnerships, how it's going to help the company, right? And be transparent. You know, you have to tell them that they're going to have to disclose some of the stuff that's not so pretty, because if you don't disclose what's not pretty, they won't believe what's pretty. Okay, and you're going to have people like me coming in and saying, well, how come, you know, you didn't tell us about your carbon emissions, whatever, right? And um, storytelling, that's part of why I want to show you the Dell video is because storytelling is so important. They're in their visuals, they're giving you the stories of each of these uh, stakeholders, right? So find real customers. I When I was at Chrysler, um, we had great stories of, of buyers of our cars who were using um, and how they came to buy this electric car um, of all ages, demographics, et cetera, parts of the country, regions, purposes. Um, and so you want to find stories. Stories are what make the messaging resonate with the audience. I mean, you know this as a marketing communications person. Um, so you want to combine the data with storytelling and find real people and real customers, um, real employees, um, and have them talk about the importance of certain issues. They're not going to use the ESG nomenclature necessarily, but they'll talk about what's important to them. Um, and you, of course, want to align with your corporate goals and the corporate strategy. And then you take these pieces and you draft messaging that aligns with the company's current messaging. Um, and you can, again, do it in modules so you can mix and match depending upon the need, the audience, the stakeholders, um, and the stakeholders can be internal also, right? So, and you, as well. So this is, this is a package of things to look at, and there's a couple more that will help you sell internally, but it will also help you sell externally. But I know, having been in corporate America, that a lot of times you have to sell this work internally as well, right? And then you want to um, also, um, it, one of the interesting things to do is to look at your company's current messaging and break it down for ESG elements. Find the pieces in it that really resonate with the ESG paradigm um, when they talk about diversity or equal opportunity or however you want to put it or you know, having, um, being good for society, what have you. And then pull that into the messaging that you use both to sell the initiatives you want to do and also to craft the messaging for ESG for your organization. And of course, analyze what your competitors are doing and bring that into your meeting. Um, Nicole, there's this really cool, uh, I'm just going to see if we can play this, but that link on Ford is the um, Ford Lightning um, market. I'm going to see if this will play. Um, I don't know if you guys, can you see that or no? No, we just have black screen. Let me see if okay. I can pull it up. Okay, I'll let you pull it up. And I wanna, one of the things I'll tell you about it while she's pulling that up is um, the Ford F-150 was a big risk. The Ford uh, uh, Lightning, the F-150 is the iconic truck in America. It's the best-selling truck in the country and might be the best-selling truck in the world. Um, and what they did by making it electric was they took a giant risk because this is a macho truck. I mean, it's the epitome of built Ford tough. Um, but what they ended up with was they grew the market seven. Let me do it differently. The chief engineer of the F-150 Lightning and the chief marketing officer of Ford told me personally directly in interviews that their the buyers of the F-150, 76% of them are new to Ford and new to the truck. That's amazing. Go click play, please. Let me do a refresh real quick and see if it'll... Sometimes it just plays. There we go. Oh. 
Oh, you hate when that happens. Right. Is it supposed to have any sound or is it? Yeah, good? it does have sound. Um, you might need to, hold on, let me. Um, and when you click and go back out and go back in, when you do it, you have to click uh, uh, optimize. I did sound. that on my end. I just think it's something off with the, the way the plugin is for the website that it's on. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, because even when I stop share, I can't get the sound to play from the website. Okay. Okay. Skip this one. Okay. I we can do that. Um, let's just see if this plays. Oh no, I'm not hearing it either. That's weird. Okay. I will stop. Okay, so you guys can um find it, but it's it's really interesting. That video has a lot of the um, different stakeholders in it, different markets in it that, what is this? Hmm. Let's try this again. Now it's showing, please move this window away from the show. There we go, okay. Um, can you see my um, PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, good. So, okay, so the other thing to do when you're selling internally is to find internal champions, you know this, but, but think about it a little bit differently. Think about who has talked about ESG issues in your organization, um, go to legal, go to finance. I, I interviewed the chief sustainability officer of a major um, hospitality chain, and they told they had been the chief financial officer, and they got into the space because they saw how much money it was, uh, their energy bills and their other waste and water bills were, were costing them, and they became the chief sustainability officer. So talk to finance. Legal, of course, is compliance, right, especially if it's a publicly traded company or a big company. Talk to your colleagues, but talk, find champions about who care about ESG stuff to help your organization, to help you craft the messaging, but also to help you sell investment in ESG initiatives and to sell investment in creating ESG messaging itself. So it's, it's integrated into all of the messaging. It's not just a bolted on for certain purposes to the nature conservancy or to a conference of greeniacs, right? So you want it to be integrated to be authentic. So find internal champions, present to influential leaders within your organization. Whose buy-in do you need? Ask their executive assistants. How do you, you know, do they talk about this? How do they operationalize it? You know, how do they put it in their lives? You know, maybe they recycle at home. Maybe their kids are really into it and you don't know, right? So um, try, and then when you're doing a presentation about it, try to get them in the room, even if it's virtual, even if it's on Zoom like this, but try to get them to be verbally supporting you in these initiatives. And uh, you know this as marketing people, but use the firm lexicon, use words that they use um, and words that their competitors use, right? And then ask them what they need to hear to say yes to you for these initiatives. And these, again, these initiatives, they can't just be bolted on. They'll look like greenwashing. They'll look like convenient, but they have to be integrated into the organizational um, operation um, into the strategies. Of course, take copious notes, but I'm a reporter. I take a zillion notes. And then track your results. Use that just really quickly. There are a whole bunch of new ESG tracking systems. Um, Salesforce has some. Others have some. Um, Sephira, Parsifany. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them that have a bunch of ways to track your results. And then what I, and refine it and report the progress. But I also want to make a really important point. Keep your results for yourself because they will help you with your performance review. Okay, so make sure that you keep your progress on these issues. And when they respond to you, if you're in a meeting and the CEO of, the, of a division says, oh my God, Susan, I love this. Can we do X? Make a note that, you know, Joe Smith, head of the blah, blah, blah division, wants to do it, blah, blah, blah. Keep that so that you have that both to make you feel better when you're getting pushed back, but also to help you build your case for your own career. 
So let me just recap really quickly and then we'll get to any other questions. Business is being called on to do more for society. This has to be citizenship. It can't just be buttoned on. Values are driving the market. So look at what is actually driving your stakeholders. What are the values that are driving them? Yes, it's the data points and reports, but there's values behind those data points, right? Um, ESG encapsulates those values. They're in their all societal values wrapped together, accountability, transparency, being uh, environmental responsibility, social responsibility, and then developing, develop the messaging that reflects your stakeholders' values and their priorities and uses their words as much as you can. And, and you know all the different vehicles you have for messaging. I don't need to get into that because you're professionals. And create alliances to help you leverage your impact leverage the data that you get back and and um, help you make more of an impact um, and build your credibility and find internal champions uh, to help you achieve your goals internally for the, and that will help the organization and also to help you in your career and to get the information you need to get the initiatives that you want to do through um, and help your career, obviously. Um, and again, building the business case. All of these pieces are building the business case, especially when you wrap it in the company's um, own goals. Uh, presenting it to leadership and again, track results and report them. Keep them informed and keep the records for yourself for your own results. And this is something I just want to emphasize before we close. Several executives have told me now that ESG has become a career advancement track. They are now looking at people in ESG roles for senior management and executive roles, including the C-suite. So keep those records, keep the messaging and go forth. And then what I am going to do is I will just have my, um, oops, didn't mean to do that. Um, I can have my um, contact information there. Um, and for some reason, I'm not seeing you guys right now, and I don't know why, but let's see if I can stop sharing. There we go. So what questions do you have? Before I let you go, I've probably gone on way too long, but um, what questions do you guys have that we haven't talked about? Um, it's not really a question as as much as much as it is an observation, but we are noticing from a recruiting standpoint, um, getting top talent in our industry right now is very competitive and um, making sure that you've uh, incorporated, you know, the ESG. Um, I had to jump out a minute ago because we had to go take a picture in front of what seemed like a million presents we're doing for Angel Tree. Um, but I mean, if from a recruiting standpoint, um, especially um, the younger folks and the ones coming out of college, I mean, they are really looking for that as a reason or a barrier to go to a company. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, as I, I mentioned, I think I, maybe you weren't here, but I'm so glad you reinforced that, Susan, because I've had C-level executives and directors of uh, of sustainability say to me, I've had my my team in you know, HR or even in finance or IT or what, something completely unrelated, call me and say, hey, I've got a candidate I'm really interested in, but they're asking, they want to know our sustainability bona fides. Can you talk to them? Um, and then Susan will be pulled in. Her name is Susan too, by the yeah. way. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, literally they're like, okay, I'll drop what I'm doing for 10 minutes, you know, whatever. But I mean, it's literally, that's how it's happening. And people are screening now, employees are screening jobs based yeah. on ESG profiling. Right. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, anybody else want to chime in? Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate your comments. Um, I'll, I'll be curious to know what resonated with you. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, Abby, Amanda, Mitch, Jeffrey, you've been very silent. You're incognito too. Mitch, Mitch is from Allie. That's okay. Kayla, 
Lisa, you look like you're, I see you on camera. Hi. Did you want to chime in? Did you have a question? Oh, no, I, um, I'm with ALI too. And I just want to okay. say a great job. I really liked your um, sort of like 10 steps about how to sell the ESG initiatives internally. Yeah, because if we can't get it, if we can't get the brand internally and the support internally to do it, we're out of luck, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty simple to me, having been there, been there, done that, right? Um, a lot of ways that I did it was I used OPM. I got other divisions or other um, parties to pay for it. So I had to do a video about this and um, the I was asked to do it in three weeks. And they, my first of all, the president of the company who was my boss and recruited me, didn't think it could happen. And I said, Rick, I'm a reporter. I've done this in four hours or three weeks is a luxury <clears throat> and not only did we do that but i managed to get another uh, the foundation of the company to pay for it <laughs> and i was like Rick, it's not even going to cost you anything i managed to do this i'll talk about partnerships there's p internal partnerships too right internal partnerships mm -hmm. are super powerful they help you build champions they build they actually they help the company too because especially if you have people who don't really get it the more, you know, the more parts of the company that get it, that come together, the it's more powerful, right? So um, anyway, well, I hope that was helpful. Um, I'm probably gone way over time, but um, lucky for me, other people were shorter. So I got the benefit. <laughs> oh, Thank you so much, Joan. Um, and we uh, do have just a few minutes left. So if there are any lingering questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or come on mute and just say, hey. Um, and we just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to all of our speakers today, to everyone who joined us, everyone who chimed in, everyone who will be watching this later. Hey, we hope you loved it. Um, and we have an amazing agenda tomorrow. If you haven't looked ahead to see what um, we're going to be covering off on tomorrow, please take a look on the website. It is uh, a jam packed agenda full of really great content and very knowledgeable speakers that I'm excited to learn from. And I hope you all are as well. Um, and we will uh, reconvene tomorrow. Any other housekeeping items from our ALI staff? You do a great job doing my job, Amanda. <laughs> you do everybody. Those are all of my points. And my last point is I went ahead and dropped a link into the survey and we do share the feedback with all of the speakers and we'll drop another one for tomorrow as well. But if you take a minute, um, we will send out a post event email. So we'll have the link as well if you don't get a chance to have watched this live or grabbed it in the chat. But um, that link is in the chat box for everyone to fill out their feedback for all the speakers. So thank you to everyone. And like Amanda said, we'll be back at 11 a.m. Eastern tomorrow with a full agenda. Thank you, everyone. And I just want to give a shout out to the ALI people for being so fabulous to deal with. They uh -huh. are Thank the you. best, the best of the best. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care, everybody. Have a good Take day, care. everyone. Have a great day. Bye.